Android is not only the most used mobile operating system, but also the most used OS in the entire history. According to StatCounter, it represents the 44% out of all the OSs in the world. But do you really think that you know all about it? Before we begin, I invite you to subscribe and leave a comment if you liked the video. I always heard comments. Hello world, Bites of here. If you're new to the channel, I make videos about tech, software, and everything in between. The Tech Iceberg series that I made is the most popular one in my channel, and I think that's fair because these videos tend to have some really interesting stuff. The last iceberg was about Linux, you can check it in the card that you are seeing right now, or in the description below. It took me a while to make this iceberg because even if you don't believe me, it was a little bit hard for me to find some weird and interesting stuff aside from the technical parts of Android. This is where I took inspiration from an iceberg that a viewer sent me via email and modified it to fit the most interesting bits into a long video that will probably have to be separated into parts. The main user that made it is just called Android, but it looks like a lot of other people contributed too. The original the original one is huge with over 400 entries, that's why this video is so long. Also, if I get any information or pronunciation wrong, please correct me in the comments, English is not my first language. I might also have to censor some things because I probably wouldn't be able to monetize the video if I didn't and I have to eat. This video only has educational and entertainment purposes. If you want the script to make a translated version of this video, you'll have it in the description below along with with all the sources I used. Just give me credits and also include these sources. In this iceberg, we're gonna see entries like consoles and weird objects running Android, creepy apps, cancelled phones and projects, and special edition phones like the Pepsi phone. Now, let's begin. Tier 1 Android Android is an open source operating system written in Java, focused primarily on touchscreen devices like phones, tablets, smartwatches, etc. Its first release was back on September 23rd of 2008, made by Andy Rubin, Rich Miner, Nick Sears, and Chris White. In 2005, Google acquired the company and has been working on the project ever since, with the latest version being Android 13. It was called this way due to its creator, Andy Rubin, whose nickname was Android. Google Play Services as I previously mentioned, Android is open source, but it has some really important proprietary or closed source components, called the Google Play Services or GMS. Most Android phones have them by default, and some apps even need them to work properly. As examples, you have the Google Play Store, Google Apps, including Gmail, YouTube, Google Maps, Google Drive, Google Photos, and Chrome, and some other ones that you don't notice at first glance, like the Firebase API, which handles databases, telemetry, and notifications for apps hosted on Google servers. These services also take care of handling payments, giving exposure notifications, showing ads, and providing the AR libraries for some apps with AR Core. Even though practically all phones have Google Play services, if you were a new phone company, you would have to comply with Google's conditions for implementing them. Phone Companies there are and there have been multiple Android phone companies, it is truly a very complicated market. I'm just going to mention the most popular ones and their main lineups. Samsung is one of the top, if not the top manufacturer in the world, mainly known for its Galaxy lineup. Next, we have Xiaomi, known for its good value phones with sub-brands like Redmi and Poco. Then we have Huawei, a brand that has lost a lot of popularity due to its US ban, but we'll talk about it later. Its main lineups are Mate and P. Moving on, we have Oppo with its Reno series, also Xiaomi's competition, Realme with the self-titled and GT series. We can't forget about the favorite one of a lot of you, and that's OnePlus with the self-titled and Nord series. Google itself, that makes some very mother-friendly and stock phones only having their Pixel lineup, previously called Nexus. Another brand is Motorola, having its G and H series. 
HTC was a giant some years ago, but they have slowly faded out. Still, I think they deserve a mention. LG recently moved away from the phone market, but I think we all can agree that they had some very interesting phones with the LG serials. And the new brand that everyone's talking about, Nothing, that just released the Nothing Phone 1 with a pretty unique design and some close to stock software. Android Skins Android is open source, which means that everyone can make their modifications to the code and create their own versions. This is what most big brands have done, creating what is called an Android skin, as it mostly only changes some visual aspects, but some of them include cool features not available in the so-called stock version of Android. An example of this is the ability to turn apps into floating windows, a desktop mode and replacing some of the default apps. Some of the heaviest skins, meaning the ones with the most amount of changes, to the point where some could be considered as bloatware or Samsung's One UI that makes its own design using blur, moving pop-ups to the bottom of the screen for better reachability, but also adding a good amount of customization, features and compatibility with their ecosystem. We have Xiaomi's MIUI that actually started as a custom ROM and now is heavily inspired by iOS with modifications like the separated quick settings and notifications panel, super wallpapers and a gaming mode. Next, we have MUI, Huawei's Android skin that even if they are stopping to use it in certain devices, it does change quite some stuff. It is also inspired by iOS with similar icons including the shape and as far as I know, they don't even have an up drawer. A very unknown one for some people is Funtouch OS, Vivo's skin, that has its own design and again adds little changes like improvements to the always on display, a custom game mode and floating apps. Then we have Oppo's Color OS that tries to not add too many features but still modifying stuff to make it more useful and customizable, as you can change your accent color, font and even icon pack. Then, let's mention Oxygen OS that was one of the most loved Android skins ever. It featured a close to stock Android base with a couple of subtle customizations and added features that Android didn't have back then. Now, Oxygen OS and Realme UI are both based on Color OS, which makes them very similar to the one previously mentioned. In fact, it is very hard to tell them apart sometimes. A lot of people got angry and disappointed with this move as Oppo now owns OnePlus and seems to be losing its identity. But that is another topic. Reaching the more stock Android skins, we have of course Google's Pixel UI. This is basically the standard for how a vanilla skin should be, follows material design, has the latest updates and adds a couple of Pixel exclusive features like free Google Photos storage, magic eraser and the now playing music auto detection features. Motorola also has its own mini Android skin, which a lot of people don't really know that has a name, that is MyUX. It adds mainly only exclusive Motorola gestures like doing a chopping motion twice to toggle the flashlight or flipping your phone over to enable do not disturb. Nothing OS has also a few changes, being the main ones to customize the glyph lights on the back of your Nothing phone, a custom font and a big circle and the quick settings that grips your network tiles. I would like to know which Android skin is your favorite one and why. I personally love stuck Android but I don't mind a few customizations here and there, like what Color OS or MyUX do. Bugjoid If you've used the Android, you have definitely seen it. It is the green and white Android's mascot. Now, the Bugjoid name is actually an unofficial one, but it is the name some Android devs used to refer to this character, so it's the closest thing that we have to an actual name. But do you know that Bugjoid was not the first option for a logo? Meet the Dandroids, the first sketch for an Android mascot. These look very different and even a little unsettling, but that's just my opinion. Irina Block, the creator of Bugdroid, said that she looked at the universal signs for the male and female public restrooms and she imagined a robot version of them. It is said that she probably also took inspiration from a character also called Android from an Atari Lynx title called Gauntlet The Third Encounter. They surely do look a lot similar, but as far as I know, Google hasn't said anything about it. 
The Android's logo has changed over the years, with mainly subtle modifications to the green tone. However, when Android 10 was introduced, Google opted for a cleaner version with just the head and a colder tone of the green. I personally love this new redesign. The green robot has also appeared as an easter egg in several games, exclusively for the Android version of Jetpack Joyride and Crozy Road as a playable character, and Sonic Dash also as a limited time playable character, and Terraria as a pet that can be summoned with an item called the Shiny Black Slab. The game Cookie Run also has a reference to Android with the character Cookie Droid that as a fun fact has a Google Play themed pet and dislikes the Apple Cookie. You probably also didn't know that a real life Android statue Gordon exists in Mountain View, where you can see statues of Bug Droid themed according to the version that they represent, like a gingerbread, ice cream sandwich, and marshmallow statues. As a fun fact, you can find in the internet collectible bug droid toys, but there are real Android-themed candies too. For example, in 2013, Google partnered with Nestlé to send 500 limited edition bug droids made of chocolate to announce their OS update. In the Google I.O. of 2012, Google gave some of their visitors a Buckdoor jelly bean container to match with the update of that year. Finally, in the Google I.O. of 2017, people were given actual Buckdoor themed Oreo cookies. I think we all have liked to eat these. Weirdly, there are people that have made Buckdoor Halloween costumes, like what you're seeing right now. Maybe we should try it sometime. Android vs. iOS in the desktop world, the rivalry is between Windows, Mac, and Linux, but in the mobile space, it is Android versus iOS because they're the two main phone OSs. People that are in favor of iOS claim that it is a more secure, private, and reliable platform. Meanwhile, the people that prefer Android is usually because they prefer a more open ecosystem with more choice for devices and programs. I think both operating systems have pros and cons, but personally, I prefer Android. Android releases There are different types of Android releases. We have main releases, for example, from Android 12 to Android 13. Minor releases like going from Android 3.0 to 3.1, tablet releases like Android 12L, and security patches that should be a monthly security and stability update independent from your Android version. Let's list all of them quickly. Starting with Android 1.0 that came out in September of 2008 and introduced the Android market, a predecessor to the Play Store, folders and the home screen, and had Google apps like Gmail, Google Contacts, Maps, Talk, Search, and YouTube. Its successor, Android 1.1 Petit 4, released the next year, had a few improvements like details and reviews for businesses and maps, the ability to save attachments in messages, and filters in the camera and photos app. Android 1.5 Cupcake in late 2009 introduced support for widgets, video recording, and playback for MPEG4 format stereo support for Bluetooth, and the ability to upload videos to YouTube. Android 1.6 Donut, released only a couple of months after its previous version, allowed users to select multiple photos to delete them, introduced support for WVGA screen resolutions, and redesigned the Android market. It is believed that the beta dessert name for this version could originally be Donut Burger. The next version, called Android 2.0 Eclair, came out again months after the previous release, still in 2009. It added compatibility with HTML5, auto brightness, and live wallpapers. In 2010, a 2.1 revision came out with the addition of Pinch to Zoom, a full screen app drawer, and revamped apps. Months later, Android 2.2 Frojo, short for Frozen Yogurt, came out. Some believe that it was originally going to be called Flan. It featured USB tethering and Wi-Fi hotspot functionality, as well as support for numeric and alphanumeric passwords. Then, in late 2010, we saw Android 2.3 Gingerbread, with copy-paste functionality, support for NFC and multiple cameras on a single device. The first Android release focused on tablets was Android 3.0 Honeycomb, 
released in early 2011. It had a redesign with a holographic-like interface, a system bar merged, the navigation buttons, and the status bar. Even though this version was only made for tablets, some people have gotten it to work on a Nexus 1 that was the phone. Some refinements were made with 3.1 and 3.2, like adding USB connectivity, support for joysticks and gamepads, and increased compatibility with more devices. The next year, 2011, Android 4.0 Ice Cream Sandwich was announced, with the new Roboto phone, hardware acceleration, and resizable widgets. Succeeded in 2012 by Android 4.1 Jelly Bean, phones running this version were now able to use Android Beam. Overall, it received many improvements to the speed of the OS. It is rumored that the beta name for this version was Jandy Kane. 4.2 and 4.3 were minor updates to Jelly Bean that added features like gesture typing, SC Linux, OpenGL3, and 4K resolution support. The following major release was in 2013 with Android KitKat, originally named Keyline Pie. It now required less RAM, showed a full screen artwork when the device is locked, and implemented immersive mode that disables the system and status bars. It is the oldest Android version Google encourages developers to support. 2014's Android 5.0 and 5.1 Lollipop, internally codenamed as Lemon Meringue Pie, simplified the three navigation buttons to the simple shapes we now know. It was the first version to implement material design with a card-based UI. 2015 would see the creation of Android 6.0 Marshmallow, internally codenamed as Macadamia Nut Cookie. It introduced a new feature called Doze that will turn Android apps off if the device has not been moving for some time to save battery. It now allowed you to use Android Pay and USB-C connections. We're getting close to modern Android with 2016's Android 7 Nougat, internally codenamed as New Joy Cheesecake. It features a native split-screen mode and a data saver. Moving on with the 2017 release, Android 8.0 and 8.1 Oreo with the internal codename of Oatmeal Cookie added a native picture-in-picture -picture mode, notifications newsing, and notification channels. In 2018, we would get Android 9 Pie, internally codenamed as Pistachio Ice Cream. It revamped the quick settings menu and the traditional navigation system with the two-button navigation that used one button to go to the home screen and swiping that same button would get you to the overview. When necessary, the back button would appear. The following year, 2019, Android 10 would come out, officially dropping the dessert names, but they are still used internally so it is Android 10, Queen Cake, or Queen Start. It was the base for Mother Android. Android with very important additions like the gesture navigation and system-wide dark theme. 2020's release Android 11 Red Velvet Cake would focus more on improving the system with a new power menu that combined the power options, home controls, and Google Pay and merged the media player with the quick settings panel. We also got finally a native screen recorder. For 2021, we got one of the biggest updates in the entire history of Android with Android 12, introducing an updated design language called Material U, Universal Device Search, and a gaming dashboard. We also saw the first tablet-focused update in a long time with Android 12L or 12 12.1 that added a taskbar and improved the large device support. With this in mind, it was not really a surprise to see though that the 2022 update Android 13 to Ramizu was not that big, including a new photo picker and enhancements to Material U, like the new progress bars and themed icon support for third-party apps. If you have not noticed the pattern, the letters follow the alphabetical order, so next year's release will be Android 14U, rumored to be codenamed as upside down cake. I'm already planning a concept video for it, so stay tuned for that. Android for Smart Devices as I mentioned in the beginning of the video, Android is not only an OS for smartphones as it can run on smart devices too. For TVs, we have Android TV that optimizes its resources and UI to be better experienced with the remote. Most TVs already come with a pre-installed, but for those that don't, there are usually sticks or boxes that connect to your HDMI input connection and convert it into a smart device with Android. One person that I know got one of these 
boxes but instead of running android tv it ran just android with a custom launcher so it was interesting to note that it recognized the box as if it was a tablet and if you were wondering yes you could siloed apps and because it is android you could technically also run android tv apps on your phone they obviously won't be properly optimized for it speaking about smart watches let's introduce android wear now just called wear os it really hasn't been that popular comparing it to apple's watch os but they both share the same goal of making a watch more connected and useful you can install apps to it if they support it and it basically behaves as an extension of your phone with the new version of wear os and the pixel watch people expect this os to finally be more mainstream but we'll see finally let's mention android auto it is a mode that gets activated when you connect with a cable or wirelessly your phone to your supported car you will be able to control stuff like the music that is playing the gps navigation and reply to messages through google assistant it tries to be useful but avoiding being distracting android easter eggs with every new major version of Android, if you tap several times on the Android version, you will get a new page with an interactive easter egg referencing the desert name or the features of your current version. I will show you all of them quickly. The first version to include an easter egg was Android 2.3 Gingerbread that just showed this picture of bug droid with a zombie gingerbread an android 3.0 honeycomb that was exclusive to tablets we only got like a blue bug droid b and that's it an ice cream sandwich if we long press this it'll grow and then we have this little animation that reminds me of nyan cat in android 4.3 jelly bean we have this jelly bean and if we long press it we get a bunch of floating jelly beans. In Android 4.4 KitKat we have this K that if we press a couple of times will show us this Android KitKat theme logo and if we long press it we'll get this mosaic of different Android versions kind of reminds me of Windows 8. <laughs> In Android 5 Lollipop, we have, well, a lollipop that if we tap on it, will change its color. If we long press it, it will show us this mini game of bug droid floppy bird. In Android 5 Lollipop as a beta, the easter egg was different originally it showed a bunch of rectangles of red and blue colors and that was a clear reference to web driver torso a google channel that became very popular because it was very weird i recommend you to look that up uh, it's kind of interesting in android 6 marshmallow we get a marshmallow that if we long press will bring us again to a similar minigame to the bug droid flappy bird but with marshmallows with android 7 nougat we get this n it's actually one of the most interesting easter eggs if we tap seven times and then long press it we can enable or disable a cat easter egg now i've enabled it and let's go to the quick settings let's edit it here it appears this little treat that we can empty the dish or select different dishes like beds fish chicken or treat and well what this basically does is it acts kind of like a food that will attract a cat. It could take minutes or hours, I really don't know how long it actually takes, but when a cat arrives, you will see a notification that says that a cat arrived, and if you tap on it, you will be able to share that cat, but that's basically it. In Android 8 Oreo, we have an Oreo again. If we tap it several times and then long press it, we will get this squid that looks kind of like myself with no will to live. 
and we can drag it and move it around and that's basically it. For Android 9 Pi, it actually changes a little bit because if we press on this, this dialog was not here before and now we have to press again several times there and if we tap on this, the P will change its color and if we tap several times on it, it will bring us to this uh, drawing app. With Android 10, we get this uh, Android 10 logo and if we press it, we can rotate stuff. So our goal is to make a Q like this and now if we press several times on the Q, we will be able to access this that I think it's called a nonogram. So basically uh, it's a puzzle that you have to complete and when you complete it, you will get a shape. I'm not gonna complete this one because I'm lazy. So let's see the next one. In Android 11, we have this dial that you have to rotate all the way. If you achieve that in the first try, I'm jealous. Android 12's easter egg shows us this clock and we have to point to 12. These material U bubbles appear and in Android 13, we have to do the same thing, but now pointing towards where 13 would be. And if we long press, we will get different types of emojis. Android memes. It surprises me that the Android community doesn't seem to have a lot of memes compared to the Linux community, but it does have some. Probably the most popular one is very relatable as we all have faced an ad of some mobile game or app whose X is just too small or it's just a plain fake one. This is done on purpose to increase the chances of us going to their Play Store page and most of the times they achieve it. I think it only hurts its reputation but well. Next we have the Android camera quality memes that basically bash Android users for supposedly having inferior cameras to the iPhone. I mean, they probably meant Android users with a low-end device because if we compare the flagship Android cameras, they really don't look any worse than what Apple has to offer. They are right in some way as Android's cameras tend to look worse than third-party apps, but that deserves its own entry. Let me tell you about the next meme. It's just one sentence. Galaxy Nexus Injured Ice Cream Sandwich Gna Pig. If you didn't get it, which is very likely, it was the confusing headline of a CNET review article for the Galaxy Nexus phone, implying that it was a test device for Android Ice Cream Sandwich. It became popular because, at first glance, the sentence doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Claim an injured version before someone else takes it was a TikTok trend where people would do the thing previously mentioned with a random video. Not much to add. Adroid 13 Installer was another meme TikTok trend where people would show a suspicious low quality Android 13 installer and when they pressed on the install button, their device would get bricked. Finally, we have the Wii Phone. This was taken from a video from 2008 that showed concepts for next generation consoles. One of them was the Wii Phone. The video now just screams late 2000s with the PowerPoint presentation style, Comic Sans font and the music. That is why it became a meme and someone actually made a Wii Phone themed app, making the Wii Phone a real thing. Samsung Galaxy Note 7 Explosion Samsung released the Galaxy Note 7 back on August 19th, 2016. It was the successor to the Galaxy Note 5, with features like expendable storage, IP68 water resistance, a curved display, a stylus, and it was powered by an octa-core Exynos 8890 with 4GB of RAM. A good phone back then, but it had one big issue, and that was the battery. More specifically, there wasn't enough room between the heat-sealed protective pouch around the battery and its internals, 
that could cause electrodes inside each battery to cramp. This, along with having thin separators, increased the risks of separator damage and short circuit. It led to some batteries overheating, setting on fire and exploding. Airports and other places started banning these phones as they could cause some accidents. And until today, it is remembered as one of the biggest Samsung failures. Siloading Android Apps the official way of installing an Android app is by downloading it from the Google Play Store. However, sometimes the app that you're looking for is not on the Play Store, as it could have been removed, doesn't follow the Play Store guidelines, or was never there to begin with. That is why some users opt for sideloading apps. The most popular and easiest method is by installing the APK file. There are several sites that can help us to get these APKs. Some are safe and legal like APK Pure and APK Mirror, others that I have not tried like Aptoido, but there are some sketchy ones that allegedly allow you to install paid apps for free, but as you can imagine, some of them include viruses, so I do not recommend installing from these, and it is also piracy. Some sites also offer the app bundle version from a program. These are the new packaging format recently introduced and now enforced to the new Play Store uploads. APKs contain everything an app has, for example, layouts for large screens, or translations, and exclusive content for some devices. This makes them a little bit bloated, as they include stuff that you don't really need. App bundles with the AAAB extension try to solve this by only including stuff that your device does need. So instead of including all translations and layouts, it only includes instructions in the form of split APKs to build an optimized APK that only has your languages and your screen resolution, saving storage. However, this usually makes them a little bit more tedious to install because you need a specific app to handle a split APKs. There are some apps that really can't be installed easily and the only way to do so is by force installing it or even decompiling it. Foldable phones before smartphones, foldable dumb phones or flip phones were very common. Companies now started to look back and thought that bringing them back could offer some good advantages, like having a tablet-sized device fold in half to turn it into a normal-sized phone, or having a normal-sized phone turn into a very little thing that fits easily in your pocket. But how would you make a modern phone whose front screen is made entirely with glass Fold. I mean, like Zach says, glass is glass and glass breaks. Well, foldable phones work with a plastic screen that even if it is way less resistant, it can fold in half. Samsung is one of the pioneers of this type of phones, with its Galaxy lineup and Flip series that have been the most successful devices of its kind. But we also have some other brands that have tried it too, like Motorola with its Razer, or my favorite implementation, the Oppo Find N, that is more of a square device which makes it more reachable when folded and has also a good tablet aspect ratio when unfolded. Some believe that these phones could be the future, but for now, it seems a little bit hard. It's new technology, so it's expensive and has a lot of room for improvement, but we'll see. Android News Websites There are news websites dedicated specifically to Android. For example, 9to5Google, Android Authority, Android Police, Android Central, and the first Android-dedicated news website, Fandroid. Navigation Methods A navigation method lets you control the three basic Android actions – go back, go home, or see the overview menu with all your apps. Originally, there were more buttons on Android phones, but they became irrelevant and the three-button navigation remained, only switching from physical to capacitive and then digital buttons. With Android 9 Pie, Google introduced the two-button navigation that is an in-between the three-button navigation and the gesture navigation. You only have one button, and if you tap it, you go home, if you swipe up, it shows you the overview, and if it's possible to go back, a back arrow will appear on the left. In the next OS update, the full gesture navigation was included, 
now allowing you to swipe up to go home, swipe up and hold to go to the overview, and swiping from the left or right edge to go back. Most people I've seen use the gesture navigation now and I prefer it too, but there are some people that also prefer other navigation methods. Desktop mode Desktop mode is a feature that some phones have that allows you to connect your phone with a USB-C to HDMI cable to a monitor. The UI will adapt itself to this bigger screen size and you will get features like floating windows or a taskbar. In the stock version of Android, we have a weird, very bare bones version of this mode introduced with Android 10. The thing was very hidden, but it shows you an app drawer and allows you to have multiple floating windows. To enable it, you have to go to the developer options and scroll down until you reach the app section, you have to enable freeform windows and force desktop mode. Still, I would recommend you to use a custom launcher that supports better this mode. The first phone to have a proper desktop mode was the Motorola Atrix that could connect to a lap dock that is basically a laptop without a processor powered by the phone itself. The most popular implementation of the desktop mode is definitely Samsung Dex, built into one UI. Even though it is exclusive to some phones, it is very complete, allowing you to have a stored menu, taskbar, and floating apps. Other brands have made their own implementations like Huawei's Easy Projection, Motorola's Ready for PC, Oxyrom's desktop mode, Xiaomi's MIUI Plus, and LG's implementation. If your OEM does not have this feature, you could try using Sentio Desktop, an app that tries to achieve the same thing. Samsung Sam In mid-2021, these unofficial renders made by Lightform of a girl promoting Samsung products called Samantha went viral. The internet was attracted by her and a lot of fan art as well as misinformation started to appear, thinking that she was going to eventually replace Samsung's official virtual assistant, Bixby, but no. The truth is that these are not official renders, they are only concepts of how a virtual assistant could look like in human form. I really do wonder why Samsung didn't follow the trend and make her an official character or something, it would have been just good marketing. Android Forks Android is technically open source, but Google manages to make life living hell for those that try to make an Android fork. And with that term, I'm referring to modifications to Android that go beyond being a commercial Google Play Services compliant skin that adds UI tweaks and a few features. Custom ROMs have their own entry, so we'll talk about them later. I'm referring to OSs that have tried to create their own ecosystems ditching Googles, with the only thing in common being that they're based on Android. First, we have Amazon's Fire OS that as you know does not have GMS, so they had to build their own Amazon services. Instead of Google Maps, you have Amazon Maps. Replacing Firebase Cloud Messaging, you have Amazon Device Messaging. Google Play in-app billing is replaced with Amazon in-app purchasing API and so on. The different launcher is the first thing you notice with tabs for different programs but also your media library, promoting services like Prime Video, Amazon Music, and Amazon Shopping. This OS is only available for Fire tablets, only sold by Amazon, and for Fire TV boxes, but it's one of the two most popular forks of Android. The second popular and commercial fork is Harmony OS. After being banned from selling products and collaborating with companies in the US, Huawei had to develop its own OS. Of course, because AOSP can be used by anyone by passing the US ban, the Chinese company took it as its base with the only issue being that it didn't have GMS. Not a big issue in China as they don't use them there anyway, but it was truly one for the rest of the world. So they developed Huawei mobile services that include the app gallery, pedal maps and search, mobile cloud, the Huawei ID, music and themes. As the name implies, it tries to harmonically connect your smart devices. It was shipped at first in Honor smart TVs, but later it arrived to smartphones, tablets and smart watches. In smartphones and tablets, it looks very, very similar to iOS. These two previously mentioned brands have had moderate success with their forks, but the next one we'll talk about is not trying to be commercial at all. 
In fact, its goal is to remain 100% open source, licensed under the GPL and sponsored by the FSF itself. Replicant OS is an Android fork that tries to remove all proprietary bits from the AOSP code. Its latest release is based on Lineage OS 13 that builds upon Android 6, so it looks dated, but it is not trying to appeal to everyone. The project is still alive and well, and looks like the next release will be Replicant OS 10, based on Lineage OS 17 that uses Android 10 as its base. If your phone is compatible with Lineage OS, chances are that it is also compatible with Replicant. Tier 2 Your phone may not be on the latest version. It is likely that your phone hasn't gotten the latest version Android 13, that is, if it is going to get it at all. Fragmentation in Android is very bad, but it is not the only reason why Android sucks when it comes to updates. As we've seen before, OEMs usually apply their own skin on top of stock Android. This is one of the reasons why it usually takes so long to get an update, because they don't ship Android as is, they have to make sure it looks and behaves how they want, and also so they have to get rid of all the bugs and make their newer devices compatible. Sometimes the update has to go through AOSP, then your OEM, next your carrier, and finally it arrives to your device, usually 6 months later. But if your phone is a low-end device, you can expect less and slower updates. OEMs don't really get anything from updating phones for several years. They'd rather make your phone lose support and force you to buy another one. The phones that have the best updates support are the Google Pixel phones, but chances are that you don't have any of these as they don't sell them worldwide. This is why there is always a one year gap between your version and the actual latest version of the OS. Stat counter shows us that most people are still running Android 11. This is a striking contrast with iOS, with the majority of phones running the latest version. Well, the version that was the latest one when I was making the script. Android's cameras suck in third-party apps. If you've just Android and iOS, you might know that usually the camera quality in Android phones is worse in third-party apps compared to the quality iPhones have. This is because there are a few amount of iPhones and apps like Instagram or Snapchat can optimize easier these cameras because they don't have a huge amount of combinations of sensors, lenses, and other specifications. Samsung has partnered with Snapchat and other developers to optimize the Galaxy S21's cameras better, and it seems like people are satisfied with the result. Google tried to fix this still present issue with the Camera X API, but we'll probably have to wait until all developers start using it until we can have better quality in third-party apps. Interactive Wallpapers Live Wallpapers is a feature introduced with Eclair that lets you have interactive wallpapers. Some are just videos but other react to your tabs, swipes, and gyroscope. MIUI has its own implementation with super wallpapers that are wallpapers usually of planets that zoom in and out when you unlock your phone. I think they are kind of a gimmick, I personally don't use them, as you can really feel your phone getting slower and draining more battery, it could also be distracting. Icon packs. In the Play Store, you can find icon packs that replace your stock icons with the ones that you like the most. Some are free and some are paid, but recently Google introduced themed icons for third party apps. That is a standardized way of having simple icons that follow your theme. To use a custom icon pack, you usually have to have a custom launcher. Launchers. A launcher is a program that takes care of your home screen's design and features. You can install different launchers and switch between them if you're not satisfied with your stock launcher. Most launchers are based on AOSP's Launcher 2 or 3. There are open source bare bones launchers that can be modified to make a more complete version. This is the case of Novo Launcher, known for being the most customizable launcher available. You can modify everything from the grid of your home screen 
to the badges on your app icons. It offers a limited free version, but buying the full version is almost a must for people that love to customize every aspect of their phone. If you prefer a more vanilla launcher with a nice few additional features, you have Launcher that is currently in its Android 12 beta, but should bring some really cool features like themed icons for all apps, even if you don't have Android 13. Another popular launcher is the Microsoft Launcher that has its own design including its own feed that lets you check a summarized version of your upcoming events and screen time as well as your news and your timeline. Then we have the Smart Launcher that automatically organizes your apps and categories, allows you to have grid list widgets and customize it however you want. Finally, the AIO Launcher tries to show you only a single home screen with a lot of important info like your frequent apps, timers, and a system monitor. I would probably use Launcher, but I hate the fact that gesture navigation support for third-party launchers is still very hit or miss. It used to work when I had my Motorola phone, but with my Redmi Note 10 Pro, it gives me a very annoying warning when I try to enable it. Android Fonts Droid Sans is the first font made for Android. It was created in 2007 by Ascender Corporation and it is licensed under the Apache license. Its main goal is to stay clear on screens of small phones. There are three variations, Droid Serif, Droid Sans, and Droid Sans Mono. In 2011, with the release of Ice Cream Sandwich, a new default font for the system was created called Roboto. This one is also licensed under the Apache license. In Lollipop, Roboto got redesigned, changing some little details like replacing the punctuation marks on letters from squared to rounded. There are a couple of variations for this font like Roboto Slap and Roboto Mono. There are some Android skins that allow you to change your default system font, but for the ones that don't, you usually have to root your phone to be able to do so. Developer Options The developer options are a series of hidden settings that allow you to access to more advanced features that usually would be useful to a developer, but sometimes they can also be useful to normal users. To enable them, you have to go to the Settings app, scroll to the bottom, tap on about device, scroll to the bottom again and tap 7 times on the build number. Now you've unlocked the developer settings. Go back, tap on system, developer options. I will only mention the ones that I think are the most useful ones for normal users, power users and developers. The first one is under debugging and it is USB debugging to use ADB and debugging mode for an app. In that same section, we have Show Refresh Rate. If you're not sure if your phone has high refresh enabled by default, you can choose to enable MAC address randomization if you want to avoid getting tracked with your MAC address. Under Networking, you can choose the default USB configuration that you want to use when you connect your phone to a computer. This is useful to set transferring files as default behavior to not have to select it every time. Under Drawing, you can select the speed for different animations. In Hardware Accelerated Rendering, you can toggle Override Force Dark to force apps with a light theme to have a dark one. Finally, if you want the desktop mode we showed you earlier, you can toggle it under Apps. You can always disable and re-enable the developer options. Material Design Material design is a series of guidelines and UI APIs Google provides, expecting apps to implement them and follow Android's current design and human interface guidelines. The first version was introduced with Android 5's Lollipop, and some components have been added over time, like the bottom app bar. But the biggest redesign to it came with Android 12, and it is called Material Design 3 or Material U. The main feature is that all the components adapt themselves to your device accent color that is taken from your wallpaper, and also the improved support for large devices. I really like it, but let's be real, most phone brands and apps value more their own aesthetic, so most of them won't implement it at all. Run Android on non-Android devices Android apps or the OS itself can run on other devices that originally didn't run it. Let's begin with the ways to run these apps on your desktop. 
Chrome OS by default has been able to run Android apps without much trouble and with functioning Play services for quite some time now. You have to download them from the Play Store. However, if you use Windows, you can try using Windows 11's Windows subsystem for Android. For now, it is limited to only some countries and you're limited to Amazon apps, but you always have the option to sideload APKs. Of course, this approach does not have GMS, even though it's possible to install them jumping through some hoops. If not having Google Play services is a deal breaker for you, then you could try BlueStacks, it is an emulator that includes them and is mainly focused on playing Android games on your Windows machine, so it's probably the most reliable option. If you use Linux, you have a couple of options, for example, Mbox, which is not an emulator but a container, making it faster and integrating it well with your applications. To install it, you have to get the snap package. There is another alternative called Wayjoid that is also a container, a Lineage OS 1 to be exact, but seems to be an improved version of Aimbox. It does require you to be using Wayland on your system though, so if you don't have it, it won't work, and it seems to be a little harder to set up. I have to mention that none of these options for Linux include GMS, but it is possible to sideload them. Because they are compatible with the Linux system, that means the Linux phones like the Pine phone can run Android apps too. And that is one of the things that Linux phone enthusiasts hope will improve, so people can switch to them easier. What about running Android apps on iOS? Well, if you have a fake iPhone, you are most likely already able to run them, as some of these run a heavily customized version of Google's OS. Else. One time, a couple of sellers tried to persuade me to buy them a fake golden iPhone 10 that was obviously running Android, but that is an anecdote that I will tell you in another video if you want. Now seriously, people have managed to make Android run on iOS with Project Sandcastle that uses the Linux kernel and modifies it as well as other elements to be able to run BugDroid's OS. Open iBoot achieves the same thing but with a different approach, making an open source implementation of Apple's closed source bootloader iBoot. This allows you to boot unsigned code like Android on iPhones. You also have ACL for Tizen that supposedly lets you run Android apps on Tizen, but I have never seen it actually working and download sites seem suspicious. For Windows Phone, Microsoft was actually developing a way of being able to run Android apps called Project Astoria, but it was cancelled so there is not an official way of doing this for this platform. Android Malware the most popular OS is definitely going to be the main target for several malware, as it is our most personal device. There are different types of viruses like AdWord that shows you intrusive ads in certain parts of the system to make money, spyware that spies on your personal information like contacts, photos, and even bank accounts, and trojans that are quiet viruses that hide themselves very well and do some very suspicious activity in the background. One of these trojans was Dendroid discovered first in 2014. It was capable of deleting call logs, opening web pages, dialing numbers, recording calls, opening apps, and performing denial of service attacks. The code leaked, and that's how we know that it had a way of binding the Android to legitimate apps. But sometimes, you don't have to download something to be vulnerable. This was the case of the Dirty Cow Vulnerability, that stands for Dirty Copy on Write, and affected all Linux systems. And as we know, that includes Android devices with kernel versions created before 2018. It allowed the escalation of privileges, and having superuser permissions means that they can basically do whatever they want with your system, like installing a key logger or running malicious code. One of the most popular spyware programs is Pegasus, developed by the Israeli cyber arms company NSO Group. It can be installed on the two main mobile OSs, and it is capable of reading text messages tracking calls, collecting passwords, and performs location tracking. I would recommend you to always keep your phone up to date, as security patches fix vulnerabilities that can be exploited to harm or steal information from your device. We constantly get news about apps from the official Play Store that were infected with malware by passing Google's inspections and the Play Store Protect feature, so be careful when choosing what apps to install. Unfortunately, Google has made it harder to know if an app
app is potential malware by replacing the permission section with the data safety section. But I'd say that if you only download very popular apps and open source apps, you could be safe. Still, only grant the necessary permissions. AOSP AOSP stands for Android Open Source Project and it is the base of all Android systems. You can get the open source code from the official website and it is licensed under the Apache 2 license, so you can make closed source forks of it. If you use it, it will be a hard experience keeping in mind that it is really not optimized for your phone, so if you have a notch, it won't support it properly, it doesn't have play services or even a browser that allows you to download stuff, so the whole experience could be this described as raw. You are seeing how it looks right now and you might have already noticed that there are some very ancient apps here as Google doesn't care about the AOSP apps because they have replaced them with their proprietary versions but that is an interesting topic that deserves its own video that I'm already working on. ADB the Android Debug Bridge is a command line tool that allows your phone to connect to a computer with a cable or wirelessly if you have a phone that runs Android 11 or above, and perform different commands with the purpose of debugging an app or modding your phone. To use it, you have to have a Windows, Mac, or Linux computer and download the SDK platform tools from the official website. Then enable USB debugging under Developer Options in the Settings app. Next, connect your phone with a cable to your PC and finally open a terminal in the location where you have the SDK tools. I'm going to mention the most common commands. We began with ADB devices that is usually the first command that you'll run to see what devices are connected and if the connection is working. ADB poll allows you to get a file from your phone to your PC and ADB push does the opposite, uploading a file from your PC to your phone. First, you always type ADB if you have multiple devices, you type dash s in the name of the device, then the command, the path that we're getting that file from, and the path that we want to upload that file to in our PC. If it says that one file was pulled, we executed the command successfully. Now, let's try with adb push. The syntax is very similar, but the parameters will be reversed. So, after push, you type the path to your file from your PC, and then where you want to send it to in your phone. You should see a message telling you that the file was pushed. Now, the next command is adb show that lets us control our phone via a terminal. So, if you already know a little bit about bash, this will be familiar to you. We'll control our phone to see the file that we exported to it from our computer. The first part of the syntax is the same, just type adb and select your device. Then, shell. If this operation was successful, you are going to see the name of your phone and a dollar sign, indicating that we are a normal user. Use the command cd, standing for change directory, and as an argument, type the path where your file is located at. Execute the command ls, that means list, to see the files in that directory, and you should see our exported file. To exit the shell mode, type exit. Now, we're going to execute the command adb logcat that lets us see all the logs that app sent to us. This is mainly useful to see if some line of code from your app that run. To cancel keep seeing the logcat, press ctrl and c. Finally, to reboot your device, just run adb reboot. ADB has had a couple of easter eggs, for example, if you run ADB hell instead of ADB shell, you would get a red and yellow terminal text and highlight colors, but the command would work the same way. Seems like this has been removed, though. You can execute ADB lolcat instead of ADB logcat, and it will still work. Typing ADB longcat will show you the logs, but in a different format. Android powered by Linux if you didn't know, Android uses the Linux kernel. That is why if you download a terminal emulator, you can execute some Linux commands but not all of them because Android doesn't have the GNU utilities. The system also shares some interesting characteristics like using MIME types to guess what program to open a file using a dot before a folder's name to hide it and app package names. When you check the kernel version, that is the version of the Linux kernel that you're using. XDA Developers 
XDA Developers is a tech news website, but they also have forums. These ones are where you should go if you're into Android modding, as the community knows a lot about it and is usually willing to help and answer your questions. Also, in your phone's dedicated sub forum, you can find ROMs, recoveries, and more. Android File System Android has a similar file system to Linux. It all starts with the root directory. Under it, we have the read-only slash system partition that has system files for stuff like the GUI, pre-installed apps, and it is basically the ROM of your phone. This partition gets overwritten whenever you get an update, but only if it is cryptographically signed by your OEM unless you unlock your bootloader. The slash boot partition has the bootloader and the kernel. Without it, your phone won't boot. Slash recovery is where your stock or custom recovery is installed. You can overwrite this partition with another one by installing a custom recovery like TWRP or twerp. Slash data is where you can find your internal and external storage. Internal storage means the data that apps create and that is intended to only be accessed by the app that created it, not by the user unless they root. For example, think of your progress files from an offline game. External storage Storage, however, refers to the part of the file system that the user is intended to use for storing and modifying their files. Storing directories like documents, downloads, music, DZIM, where you will find your taken photos, Android, where your apps store their public data, and pictures. This location is known as slash storage slash emulated slash zero or slash SD card. That is a link to the first one mentioned. The zero in the path is some sort of ID for the default user user, but if you created more users, it will change according to them, having another number instead. Under slash data as external storage, you can also find your external removable storage, like an SD card or a USB. That is, if you choose to use it in portable mode, that behaves like its own entity, similar to how it works when you use external storage on a computer. If you decide to use the adoptable mode instead, it will fuse the removable SD card with your internal storage, meaning that you will only get more storage and it will be seen as one entity. But if you remove the removable removable device, apps will start to fail and files will go missing. When you format your phone, the only thing that gets wiped is the data partition. Slash cache is where important and frequently accessed data will be, and in slash misc is where other stuff is stored, like the carrier or region ID. Activities an activity is basically a full screen page that displays content, and that is what Android apps are made of. They can also be presented as floating windows. Activities can overlap previous ones, but these last ones can still be retained in memory. A very good example of this is when you're going through some menus in the settings app. An activity has four states. The first one is when it is active. That means that it is the one that the user is currently interacting with, and it is at the highest position of the stack. If the activity activity has lost focus but it is still shown, its state is visible. In this case, the activity maintains its state and information as well as remaining attached to the window manager. If an activity is obscured by another one, then it is stopped. It retains all information but could be killed by the system when memory is needed. When the system wants to kill an activity, then its state is destroyed and has to be loaded again if you want to display it to the user. Android Manifest.xml the Android Manifest is an XML file that every app has and that declares the most important things like all the activities, services, broadcast receivers, and content providers. Here you can also find all the permissions the app needs as well as the name, icon, and package of the name itself. The first Android phone. The first commercial Android phone was the HTC Dream, also known as the T-Mobile G1 in the US and some parts of Europe. When Google acquired Android Inc. back in 2005 to compete against Symbian and Windows Mobile, it led to the creation of a prototype of the HTC Dream, codenamed as the Sooner. It was a phone similar to BlackBerry with small, non-touch screen, navigation keys, and physical keyboard. When Apple announced the iPhone, they had to switch 
switch their focus, creating the device that we currently know. Android also adapted to this new vision, being officially unveiled in November of 2007. When it released, the reception was mixed, as everyone was comparing it to the original iPhone, and it couldn't compete as well in some aspects, like media consumption, as Apple integrated its iPhone with iTunes, but in general, people were excited to see how Android improved, as it promised a new, open ecosystem contrasting to Apple's iPhone OS. Tier 3 Dragon Ball Z Naming Conflict in the anime Dragon Ball Z, there is this character called Android 13, which makes it very easy to get confused, not knowing if someone means Google's OS or the character. This is very evident when looking for pictures mainly, as both appear in the results. This is why some people thought that Google would change the name of the latest iteration of Android to avoid the naming conflict, but it didn't end up happening. This against Android users. It is somewhat known that because iPhones are very expensive and Androids are usually cheaper, there are some Apple users that have some sort of elitism and they pick another phone's users. This is obviously not the case for all people that use iPhone, it is just the vocal minority. Times of India published an article where based on a 1,500 people survey made by the company Declutter, they came up with the conclusion that most people would prefer to date an iPhone user over an Android user. Malta Daily did a similar thing but based on a British dating app called Palm, where 3,000 people selected that something that would turn them off would be a person using an Android device. A very known controversy that for some of us feels like a first world problem is the green versus blue bubbles thing. If you didn't know, most people in the US use iPhones and for messaging they use the default iMessage app that comes with it. Messages between iPhones and Apple devices are represented with a blue bubble. These ones have exclusive proprietary features that Apple has included and they're better overall. Android users messages are represented with a green bubble. That means that that message uses MMS, which is an old technology that does not have read receipts, encryption, high-risk media sharing, and a lot of other features that we expect from a modern messaging app. RCS has all of these things and is a standard that could improve compatibility between iPhones and Android's messages only if Apple decided to support it. But if they did, all messages would have the same features regardless of what phone you use, making it easier for other people to switch to an Android phone. Google has tried to make Apple to do something to fix it, but hasn't achieved anything. And now, basically when everyone sees a green bubble, they know that person is using Android, and it's common for childish people to pick another ones that do not have iPhones. Rooting in Unix-like systems such as Android, there is a user called the super user or just root user in reference to the fact that it is the only user that can affect the root file system. It has absolutely all permissions to do everything that is possible from creating a normal file to deleting the entire system with a file explorer that lets you use these privileges, like material files. This is why, as a security measure, but also to lock down Android to an extent, the root user is disabled by default, and you cannot enable it unless you unlock your bootloader, which forces you to factory reset as well as rooting does, and you will lose your warranty. Programs like Majisk or SuperSU allow you to enable this root user and grant its permissions to apps, usually by patching the boot image. Some other programs like Kingo or Kingroot allegedly allow you to root your phone with just one click without having to unlock the bootloader nor using a computer. They seem very suspicious to me, but maybe they did actually work in the past. I just wasn't using Android back then to confirm it, so please let me know in the comments. There are a couple of reasons why you would want to root your phone, like removing bloatware, customizing your phone's UI, or removing ads. There are also so-called unrootable phones, or phones that are very hard to root, mainly because they don't allow bootloader unlocking. On the 
opposite side though, there have been reports of phones that actually have access to ADB root because the OEM forgot to disable it. However, keep in mind that when rooting, some apps, especially banking apps, will detect it and won't allow you to use them unless you use a Majesk module to hide it. Custom ROMs a custom ROM is an alternative operating system based on Android that can be installed on supported devices that have an unlocked bootloader. It is mainly useful to get another software if you don't like the stuck one or if your phone won't get any more updates and you still want to be up to date. Some of these offer a very vanilla experience in favor of battery life and stability, sometimes allowing you to de-google the phone like Aero OS or the most popular ROM, Lineage OS, that is the successor of Cyanogen Mod. Others provide a more complete experience with more features like Pixel Experience that tries to replicate the feeling of Google Pixel phones. There are ROMs that focus on gaming and full customization such as CR Droid, and Calyx and GOS are privacy and security focused ROMs that make improvements to AOSP focused on the things previously mentioned. For example, being de-googled, scrambling the passcode keypad, and having a firewall. Most of these are open source, so you can contribute to them if you like. Keep in mind that individual developers work on them, not big corporations. Custom ROMs are usually device-specific, so not all phones will be able to install one, but some projects publish a ESI that stands for Generic System Image, basically allowing you to install it on all phones that support the project Trouble, which are most these days. The bad thing about these OSs is that in most cases, you lose support for the original camera app of your phone, so you will not be able to take full advantage of all the lenses. There are some exceptions though, like ANX camera, and it's nice to see them. Taskbar Starting with Android 12 L, a new taskbar was introduced for large screen devices that fuses together your favorite apps and the system navigation. It allows you to directly launch an app quickly or drag it to a side to open it in split screen. With this year's update, a shortcut for the app drawer was also added to the taskbar, basically making it a start menu. If you don't have these updates or a tablet, in the Google Play Store there is an open source app called Taskbar that lets you replicate some of this functionality and is compatible with the hidden AOSP's desktop mode. Android x86 Android has been relying officially on the ARM architecture as that is the one most phones have these days. However, there are some projects that take care of porting Android to the architecture that most PCs still have, and that is x86 or x64, meaning that you can install it on these devices. Because the green OS supports mice, keyboards, and a lot of other devices, it usually works very well on PCs, and I guess the experience will be better when they support Android 12L that improves a lot the UI and UX for large screen devices. Some of the reasons why you would want to install this could be to revive an old PC, to play mobile games in a big screen with controllers or other peripherals, or also to make your own TV box like we've seen before. If you're interested, I will mention some OS's that allow you to do this, like Remix OS, Phoenix OS, Prime OS, Bliss OS, and Open Thoughts. Android killed all mobile OSs except iOS. Like it or not, today we just have two main mobile OSs, Android and iOS. These are the ones that survived the competition, which included some other software like Symbian, which became outdated, Windows Mobile that lacked a lot of apps, mainly from Google, likely on purpose, Tizen, which I think nobody actually used, and Firefox OS that was promising but never caught on. I think that the reason why they became mainstream was because iOS brought something new to the market and Apple was already a big brand to back it up. Speaking about Android, I think that it was because it was the first open source phone OS, which allowed a lot of brands to adopt it quickly. Currently, the only competition these giants have are Linux phones, like the Pine Phone or Librem 5, but these are definitely not ready at all and still have a ton of issues, but it's the best we got. You might have heard of Kai OS, but that one doesn't really try to compete with Apple and Google's creations. It is based on Firefox OS and its main goal is to try to make them phones a little bit more more modern, but nothing more really. 
Fur Phone Tired of disposable, quick, and garbage phones that barely get any updates and just add up to the already huge amount of e-waste, then the fur phone could be for you. It is built to be as sustainable, repairable, and recyclable as possible. The latest iteration of the series is the fur phone 4 that has 5G, a small notch, dual cameras, a Qualcomm Snapdragon 750G, and 128GB with 4GB of RAM. There are a couple of downsides though to begin with, the price is a little bit too expensive, but it could be totally justified to some of you. 580 euros. Availability is also limited to some countries of the EU and the US. Also, its display is IPS running at 60 Hz, which could be a deal breaker for some of you. Updates, even though guaranteed, are really slow. The phone still has Android 11. However, I still think that it's nice to see something fresh in such a saturated and market. Fuchsia OS This is a new operating system that Google has been developing for a while and that we barely know anything about. It's named after the color Fuchsia that is a combination of pink, which was the codename of Apple's advanced pink OS of the 90s, and purple, also the codename of the first generation iPhone. So we can have an idea that Google is probably planning something very big with this project. The company hasn't said a lot about it, being the first time we knew about it in 2016, after media outlets reported a mysterious source code repository on GitHub. Inspector of the code suggested its capability of being able to run on multiple devices like traffic lights, watches, phones, tablets, and PCs. Fuchsia OS doesn't have a Linux kernel like Android and Chrome OS do. It has its own one called Zircon that is inspired by Unix kernels but has some differences with them, like representing resources as objects instead of files. In 2021, thanks to a software update for the Google Nest Hub, its previous Chromecast-based software was replaced with Fuchsia OS. Even though there are no visual differences, so you wouldn't be able to Tell. It is planned for Fuchsia to have something codenamed as Stornex that would be a compatibility layer making it able to run Android and Linux apps. Because of this, a lot of people think that this project could be not only a replacement for Android but also for entire Linux based OSs in general. But again, this is only a speculation. Android Studio this is the program that is used to develop native applications for Android and its variations like Wear OS and Android TV. It allows you to code, design UI, compile, and test your program with the emulator or by connecting your phone with the USB debugging enabled. It's based on JetBrains' IntelliJ IDEA being available for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. The latest stable release is Android Studio Chipmunk from May of 2022. Weird phones. There have been multiple weird and interesting Android phones, for example the LG Wing. That was a phone that had two screens and the one on top could rotate forming a T-shape. This would be useful to play a video and have the screen on the bottom as a media controller or to have a better gaming experience on devices that supported it. Samsung made its own weird phones like the Galaxy Beam that had a projector or the Galaxy Round that was, well, curved to be more comfortable to use, I guess. LG also made its own curved phone called the LG G Flex, but the cool thing about it was that it was also able to heal its own rear cover from minor scratches. The Jota phone was a phone with an e-ink display on the back, which could be compared to what we know now as an always-on display, but a little bit more advanced because you could interact with it. Asus made the Pad phone that was a phone that could be inserted into a tablet and the phone would power it. The Cubex Q phone has an interesting feature. It allows you to see 3D content without glasses as well as taking 3D photos and videos. It does cost $700 though. Packet Capture this is an app that, by using a VPN, allows you to see all the traffic that your phone has in the background without root. It also lets you see the contents of this traffic, even though most of it is obviously going to be encrypted. Only use this for educational and debugging purposes. Android in Space 
Similarly to Linux, Android has gone to space. A PC World report claims that in 2012, NASA was planning on sending miniature satellites constructed with Android-powered Nexus 1 smartphones. But two years before, in 2010, Google had already sent seven payloads to space to improve Google Maps and Google Sky Maps. They sent them with a Nexus S phone that recorded the space along with a bug joy toy that was included consoles running Android. An article by Trusted Reviews says that Nintendo originally wanted to make a portable console, most likely the Switch, run a modified version of Android. They believe this because the executive chairman of Cyanogen Mod, Kurt McMaster, published an outdated tweet that claimed that in the early days of Cyanogen, Nintendo wanted them to make an OS for them, but they rejected them. It is believed that the Switch now runs a modified version of BSD along with some Android code, but nothing is confirmed of course. But you know the modern community, they always find a way, achieving to make the Switch actually run Android 10, as you can see in this report by XDA developers, it can even run some emulators. Speaking about consoles really running Android, you've probably heard of the Oya. It was an Android console founded by Kickstarter, raising over $8 million, but it ended up being a failure, discontinued two years after its release. Breaking if you flash a custom ROM, root, or do any modification to your phone improperly, you can get a series of errors. None of these are nice to see and they can make you very worried. The least alarming error that you can get is a boot stock or boot loop. This makes your phone boot but never go past a certain point, usually the boot animation. In other cases, it keeps rebooting but never boots to the system. It's normal for your phone to take a couple of minutes to boot the first time you install a new custom ROM, so I would only worry if you see that it's taking more than 10 minutes. This is also known as soft breaking, meaning that your phone is useless because it doesn't have a system, but can be fixed by flashing another one from the recovery. However, the one that I hope that you never experience is a hard break, where usually some core components like the kernel or the boot partition got damaged, not even allowing you to boot into fast boot or the recovery, making it, well, as useful as a brick, and can't be recovered from that state. The Googling the Googling is the process of removing Google Play services and any Google app from your phone. This can be done easily by installing a custom ROM that doesn't include them with what it's usually called a vanilla build. You can find these on some ROMs like LNHOS or AeroOS. Keep in mind that as we've mentioned before, a lot of third-party apps also depend on GMS, so they will stop working or have a limited functionality without these libraries. For example, Uber doesn't work because it uses the Maps API. Anything with in-app purchases won't work either, and apps that use Firebase to send notifications won't ever send them. But if you like a middle ground, there is something called MicroG. This is an open source GMS spoofer that lets you have some more functionality, while keeping your privacy and most of the benefits of doing the practice in this entry. Even though, I would not recommend you to link your Google account to MicroG, as it is said that if the company that tech that you're using it, it can terminate your account. You can also use a Play Store alternative called Aurora Store that has literally the same apps but allows you to download them without the need of signing in. There is an app called Plexus that shows you a database of apps, ranking them with two values according to how well they work without the services and how well they work with MicroG. It is very similar to something like ProtonDB. Sounds like such a pain and a big sacrifice, so so why would you want to do this? Well, there are some pretty good reasons actually. Because you have no play services, you can be sure that there is no tracking, as Google doesn't include that at the AOSP level because if it did, it would have to be open source. Not having them also means a performance and battery increase. I've heard that battery life doubles in the Google phones, but I cannot confirm it. Also, you won't see any ad powered by the Alphabet's company in your apps. Terminal Emulators there are terminal emulators for Android being the most popular one, the open source Termix, that allows you to execute some commands, install packages, and it's mainly useful if you have root, as some Majesk modules don't have a UI and to set them up, you need to use the CLI. Android users vulnerable to error text 
gang. Apple recently started selling a new product called the AirTag. Its purpose is to track objects that could easily get lost or robbed. It is different from your usual tracker because every Apple device contributes to a network that reports the last location of your AirTags, making it very effective in a country like the US, where most people use iPhones. People with bad intentions knew that they could probably use these tags to track people down, but iPhones will show you an alert if they detect that an AirTag has been near for too long. This is not the case with Android phones. Yes, Apple did release an app for Android that does the same thing, but the main issue is that this app does not work in the background, so you have to manually look for them, making people without iPhones more vulnerable to this risk. Tier 4 extremely cheap Android phones. Because Android is free to use, anyone can make a very cheap phone running it. You can find some on Amazon, mainly from brands like Blue or Alcatel. Some of these even cost $30. However, there are always cheap clones of phones, usually on Wish.com, like the ones you're seeing right now. Made to fool people into thinking they're buying a flagship isn't very similar names, but you'll notice it's fake when you start seeing the specs. Phones with infrared There are phones that include infrared sensors. Most Xiaomi phones still do. This can be useful to control your smart devices or your TV. But to be honest, I've never used it, even when my phone has it. App cloning this is a feature available in some skins that allows you to have the same apps, but several times, each one having their own data. In MIUI, this is called dual apps. This is useful, for example, when you want to have multiple profiles on social media, or you want to have different save files in games. If your skin doesn't support this, there are other alternative ways of doing it, like with this app called App Cloner that does the same thing. But some people probably didn't know that you can actually do this and stock Android without any third-party apps, or well, it's very similar, by just creating another user account. It will have their own apps, data, wallpaper, and everything. Android Design Errors like with every UI, the green OS has had a couple of design errors that follow the trends of different times. A channel that I found while making this video called Undefined made a great video about it. I'm going to summarize their work, but I recommend you to go and check it. It's criminally underrated. This was not sponsored, by the way, I have like 2000 subs, so it wouldn't even be worth it. They propose six eras of the UI design, starting with the primitive era between 2008 and 9, including 1.0 cupcake and donut, it can be described as having a detailed and cartoonish style, but it was very inconsistent as some apps had a dark or light theme without any standard. Comprised of Eclair, Frojo, and Gingerbread, we have the pre-Holo era that is an in-between the previous one and the Holo era, mixing some elements of the primitive era but simplifying a lot of the icons and making it more consistent. Moving on with the Holo era that features Ice Cream Sandwich, Jelly Bean, and Kit Kat, thanks to Project Butter, the smoothness and usability of the OS improved a lot. Things got cleaned up and a dark theme was standardized for all system apps. Kit Kat changes things a little bit, mainly making them brighter. Next, the paper cut era with lollipop, marshmallow, and nougat. It flattened all the icons, added drop shadows, pointed corners, and floating buttons, thanks to the introduction of the first material design. Oreo started the no frills or clean era that finished with Android 11. It focuses on practicality and cleaner, more rounded looks. The latest one introduced with Android 12 was the Material U era, that based everything on the color of your wallpaper, adapting all the apps that support it to a new palette each time you change it. It is way more rounded, but also has some interesting shapes. Even though it's my favorite one, I think it wastes space in some elements. Don't set this as your wallpaper. 
In early 2020, this picture became viral, but not for good reasons, as it was crashing or even soft wrecking Android phones that run Android 10 or below. Why? Well, it turns out that Android uses the sRGB format, but this image uses RGB, which Android fails to convert to sRGB, something caused accidentally by the photographer, as they edited the photo on Lightroom and used it on their iPhone, so they never found out about it until it became viral. Setting this as your lock screen wallpaper will cause your phone to crash every time that you see it and that will provoke a boot loop. Seeing the image and downloading it won't cause anything, only setting it as your wallpaper will. It has been fixed with Android 11 though, but don't ever try to do it if you're on a previous version. Lucky Patcher it's an app that requires rip privileges that claims to be able to unlock locked content from an app or game, get in-app purchases as well as paid apps for free, and block ads from applications. I don't think this is very legal, so I would not recommend you to use it. Also, because if Google finds out that you use it, it can terminate your account. Android Modes there are a lot of Android modes, but the main ones, or the ones that most phones have, are the bootloader or fast boot mode that lets you boot to the system or to the recovery and also to flash stuff but only with ADV. In Xiaomi devices, this mode has a bunny that is its mascot. If you boot to the recovery, you will be able to wipe the data of your phone and if you use a custom recovery, you can flash ROMs or other things without the need of using ADB in a computer. If you decide to boot to the system instead, depending on your phone, if you hold down the volume down button, you will boot into safe mode that will only include the apps that originally came with your phone. This is useful if you have a third party app that is causing your system to fail. There are more obscure modes, usually exclusive to certain companies like Motorola that is the king of these modes. I will only mention them quickly as they tend to be very similar, starting with upload, ramp dump and crash mode that is basically a kernel panic screen, like Unix systems BSOD. In Lenovo, Motorola and LG phones, there is the factory mode that lets you test how well the hardware is working. Lenovo and Motorola again have the meta mode that allows a phone to update or reinstall software but some people say it's just fast boot. For Samsung products, you have the maintenance mode making you able to choose between the bootloader, recovery, safe mode and factory reset. Also the download mode that is like fast boot but without the ability of executing commands and only being able to flash with a specific manufacturer tool like Odin. In some Pixel phones since Android 10, you get the rescue mode that surprisingly it isn't very clear what it is for. It only says that it's waiting for rescue commands but it seems to be made for technicians to be able to repair a phone, registering new parts with commands or something like that. Finally, meet the Qualcomm ADL mode that is used to flash custom ROMs via a special tool. You can cannot modify this mode having to physically open the phone to fix a brick. Forensic companies discovered a vulnerability in the mode that let them extract data from locked screens. Running other software on Android devices Using software like Andronix, you can install a Linux distro on your phone without the need of having to root. Even though if you do have it, you can install Kali Linux for educational penetration testing. If you wish to do so, you can completely replace Android with Linux by installing Ubuntu Touch if your phone is supported. Thanks to Android 13's improved virtualization support, Twitter user at KDragon was able to run Windows 11 under Pixel 6. Interestingly, it seemed to adapt fine to the phone's resolution, but it was barely functional due to the lack of hardware acceleration. Columbia Cicada, previously known as Cider, also allows the native execution of iOS apps on Android. Here's a picture of it running iTunes on an Android tablet. Factory Reset Protection when your phone gets stolen, one of the first things the thief will do is to factory reset your phone. They can do this without having to crack your password by rebooting to the bootloader, then to the stock recovery that all phones have, and then they select the option to wipe data. But why is such a dangerous feature so easily accessible? Well, it turns out that it's a security feature. If you forget your password, then you will not be able to access your phone, being the only options you have to unlock it somehow, buying another one or factory. Resetting. This can also be used by people with bad intentions 
but that's why it exists. Google understood this and starting with Lollipop, after factory resetting your phone and not signing out of your Google account, when you go through the setup process, it will ask you to sign in to the latest Google account linked to the device, stopping you from finishing the setup and thus being able to use the phone. I've seen that it can be bypassed, but probably they have already patched it. Because it is linked to your account, I guess that this won't work with phones that do not have GMS. All Android phones have a codename. In case you didn't know, practically all Android phones from known companies have code names. This makes it very useful in the modern community to know exactly which device is which, skipping the branding, original, and modified it versions names. For example, you might think that stuff made for the Poco X3 NFC is compatible with the X3 Pro, but they're not the same phone, and you can confirm it by looking at the code names. One is Serja, and the other one is Value. Boot animation .zip. These are a type of zip files that you are able to move only with root to the slash system slash media directory. It will replace your stock boot animation with a custom one, even though it doesn't always work for all ROMs, but it's interesting to see that it's a thing. Custom kernels. Thanks to Linux and the AOSP, you're able to create your own custom kernels and use them with different ROMs. Some provide patches or fixes, performance or battery life improvements, or support for other devices or file systems. Some popular ones are the Sultan kernel, Archer 97 kernel, Elemental X kernel, Blue Spark kernel, and the Kurisakura kernel. Android versions before 1.0 before the first official stable version of Android, there were some important releases. For example, the built HTC 2065.0.8.0.0, which is the earliest known build of our OS. It already had a search bar, a dock, an app drawer, a browser, Gmail, a notepad, context, calculator, SMS, and camera. Android M5RC14A was the first build to include touch UI support, a notifications panel, even though it was empty, and new icons. Finally, we have Android 0.9, the final experimental version of the operating system, released along with the respective SDK. It is more familiar to what we now know, you can notice it by looking at the home screen. Android 404 game. From 2016 to 2019, you were able to play a little minigame if you encountered the classic error 404. That means that the page of a website doesn't exist. In the game, bug droids launch pink donuts, blue jelly beans, or white marshmallows to the center, and you had to rotate the glass pipes to send each dessert into its corresponding pipe. Now, if you get the same 404 error, you will just get a message but no game, so to play it, you have to use the Wayback Machine. Other objects running Android. It is really interesting how Android can run on a lot of other objects. For example, it powers fridges like the Samsung T9000, thread mills, headphones, bicycles, cameras like the Samsung Galaxy camera, touch displays like the ones made by Newline Interactive, and even cases for iPhones. Yes, a case for iPhone runs Android. It's believed to be the OS used by the Facebook portal, Google Home, and Amazon Echo smart speakers. But the spot for the weirdest thing running it definitely goes to this urinal. Why does this thing even need to have a screen is beyond my understanding, but you can clearly see that it runs Google's OS. Android 10 an OS X is an anime character that represents an operating system. There are characters for Windows, Linux, and of course, Android. You're seeing the Android 10 right now, and yes, she has a USB-C tail. Let's not talk about it. APK Tool This is a program written in Java licensed under the Apache 2 license that lets you reverse engineer APK files. I really don't know why would you want to do that other than trying to recover your own app's lost source code, which has actually happened to me. But if you try to do it for other apps, then I don't know how legal that is, as some consider reverse engineering the source code as violating the copyright. So don't try it. Pokemon Go deaths and injuries caused by Android phones. 
Do you remember 2016? Well, if you do, you know that it was ruled by Pokemon Go, that mobile game that used AR and location tracking to incite you to go out of your house and walk to find some Pokemon. The issue is that even when the game tells you to look at your surroundings, a lot of people didn't, and that caused a lot of accidents, from falling to crashing with some vehicles. Tier 5 Alternative Stores Google OS allows you to use third-party apps other than the Play Store. For example, you have the Aurora Store that allows you to download the exact same apps that are on the Play Store but anonymously, even though you do have to sign in to purchase apps. It tells you the permissions and trackers that apps come with. It's very useful if you plan to the Google. But if you're a free software enthusiast, you should probably use Fdroid that is a store where you can only find open source software. It looks a little bit dated and is slow when syncing repositories, so I would recommend you to use a better client like Droidify or the Neo Store that have a more up-to-date design and more features. Other companies try to not rely too much on Google and have made their own stores, like Samsung's Galaxy Store or Huawei's App Gallery. They're not as popular as the default store, but they do have some apps that you probably use. May 23rd, One UI Bug On May 23rd of 2020, in China, Samsung phones like the S8, S9, S10, and S20 series faced a serious bug where some of them would crash and reboot to their recovery. This happened because May 23rd is a date related to China's lunar calendar, causing the system to calculate this time incorrectly and then fail if you didn't update the calendar app before this date. The solution was to change the date to one month earlier or to update the calendar app, but I think this is something that we all wouldn't want to happen to us. Android originally meant for cameras in 2013, Andy Rubin revealed that Android was originally meant for digital cameras. They wanted to create a platform where you would have cloud storage for images and videos without having to rely on the internal storage. He showed the idea to investors, but the idea didn't really caught on, claiming that, quote, it wasn't actually a big enough market. They changed focus to now design a smartphone OS, Google came in, bought the company, and you know the rest. A color was named after Android. The color that you're seeing right now is called Android Green. It is a shade of Caribbean green described by Google as the color of the latest design of Bugdroid. If you're curious, its hex value is 3DDC84. Steve Jobs hated Android. Steve Jobs, the most iconic and important CEO of Apple, really disliked Android as he considered it a betrayal from Google because Apple worked with them in the development of the iPhone, and you can notice that by looking at one of the apps that came pre-installed with the original iPhone being one of the maps powered by Google Maps. This was very similar to what had already happened to Apple with Windows, claiming that Microsoft stole the GUI concept. To reinforce Steve's hate towards Android, here's a quote that he said, taken from the book Steve Jobs by Walter Isaacson. I will spend every penny of Apple's 40 billion in the bank to right this wrong. I'm going to destroy Android because it's a stolen product. I'm willing to go through a nuclear war on this. Special Edition Phones Sometimes, companies make weird collaborations, creating some special edition phones like the Pepsi P1 and P1S. These were phones made back in 2016 with Pepsi branding. They were only available through a crowdfunding campaign on a Chinese site called JD.com. Interestingly, seems that the reviews were positive and that it was overall a good mid-ranger for its time and price. I also wanted to mention that I find funny and sad that this Computer World review calls the phone a phablet, but it was only 5.5 inches, <laughs> compared to the 6.6 .6 plus inches monstrosities that we currently have. It ran Ditto OS and Android Skin also available for some 2G phones, 
As expected, they were Pepsi-themed. Also, Huawei partnered with Kentucky Fried Chicken to make 5,000 limited edition KFC phones, which are in reality just a special version of the mid-range Huawei Enjoy 7 Plus. It had a 5.5 inches 720p display, a Snapdragon 435 SoC, a 12 megapixel camera, 3 gigabytes of RAM, and 32 gigabytes of storage running Android 7. It came with $10,000K, which is a virtual currency used by KFC in China, and there is a pre-installed music app that allows you to create playlists and share them in the restaurant. Overall, a unique phone, but I don't think anyone would be seriously daily driving it. It's very basic. Marshall, a music equipment company, made the Marshall London, a phone for artists. It was a very basic phone with a Snapdragon 410, but its media consumption capabilities are way above your average phone. For example, there are front-facing stereo speakers, a serious logic sound card, and two audio jacks that can be used for listening and recording. Weird Apps There are a lot of weird Android apps. I will only mention a few, starting with Shake Me. You have to do what the name of the app says, and when you do, a dancing Batman appears with music, that's such. But to be honest, it really did freak me out the first time that I saw it. I was expecting a jump scare, and I did kind of get it. The next step is called Send Me to Heaven, and encourages to throw your phone very high. Of course, this has the risk of damaging property, other people, and the phone itself. That's why you have to accept a bunch of warnings before getting to play the game. I don't recommend you to try it, I only did it for this video and you can see that my score is ridiculously low. The Abu Mu collection is a series of apps that cost $400 each, making a total of $2,400. What does it do then? Well, it just adds a gem widget to your home screen, that's it. It's like saying you're rich but without explicitly saying so. Remember gave the dog? Yeah, that dog that appeared on music memes. Well, there's an app that features him, where you can tap off one of the gapes that appear there and each one will bark in a different note. Brainwash is a generic puzzle game, but that features some very inappropriate minigames that you can have an idea of by just looking at the pictures. For some reason, it is still on the Play Store. But Eat, the revolution, is definitely the weirdest app from the list. The game tells you to tap to bite food. With a couple of bites, you eat the food. Then a message appears and you have to repeat the whole process again. That is unusual, but when it gets really weird is after you restart the game a couple of times and keep playing for some minutes. Then you start to get weird objects to eat, to eat nasty shoes, teeth and baby dolls. Weird music and people laughing in the background starts to be heard. Then you run out of food and the credits appear. It looks like it actually has a meaning, or at least that's what the description of the app and messages lead me to believe. And my interpretation is that it has a critique against capitalism, where consumerism will lead us to a point where there will be no food left, and we will have to eat stuff that we're not supposed to to survive. Or they could just be trolling. Lockdown apps. There are apps like the one you're seeing right now that locks down your Android phone and only allows you to use certain apps. It also disables hardware buttons and status bars. If you ask me, I don't know how it is available on the Play Store, as blocking hardware buttons could be considered against the store's terms of service. I mean, it's almost malware and forcing someone to use it, even in a work environment, to me is one of the most toxic and dystopian things you can do. Boring Phone It's a phone that tries to bridge the gap between a dump and a normal smartphone, mainly for people who want to spend less time on their phones. They achieve this by only providing a set of average, boring, and useful tools, like a music player, calculator, gallery, notepad, calendar, clock, and voice recorder. The icons are not even in color to avoid provoking some emotion. It has some very basic specs, but I mean, you don't really need much. I think they're enough, as the phone probably doesn't even have GMS. Android Forensic Tools 
Forensic science takes care of collecting evidence for an investigation. This also includes digital evidence like chats, photos, videos, and files. That's why there are forensic tools designed to exploit some vulnerability on your phone with the objective of getting information from you. Some of these programs or companies are Celebrite UFED, Oxygen Forensics, Magnet Axiom, Mobile Edit, and MD Next. If you're planning on going to download any of these programs, let me tell you that they only usually sell them to organizations or governments, not to individuals. They should only be used to gather evidence of a suspect, not by people to spy on other people. Even Intel made an Android phone. This is the Intel AZ210. It runs Android Ice Cream Sandwich powered by an Intel Atom Z2460 processor. It came out back in 2012. I don't think it was very successful because how many Intel powered phones have you seen in the streets? Weird Samsung Features Samsung is not afraid of experimenting. They have made some weird features, for example, the Samsung Air View that will perform an action, usually a preview, when you hover your finger or the S Pen over the area that you're interested in. This is taken a step further with the Air Gestures that let you move your hand over the screen of your phone to accept calls, move between pictures or pages, and to wake your phone up. Samsung Smart Scroll moves the content that you're seeing when you tilt your head. Smart pause pauses the video that you're watching but when you're not looking at the screen. These all seem very gimmicky to me but I really have to admit that they were a lot of years ahead with the smart rotation feature. Like the name suggests, this is basically auto rotate but based on your face. If that sounds familiar, it is because Android 12 introduced it but they had it all way back since Android KitKat. A weird fact is that the S4 and Note 3 had temperature and humidity sensors for some reason. It seems that it was just something used to get that information but nothing more. Tor it's a browser available for multiple platforms, including Android, designed specifically for anonymity, security, and privacy. It works through something called onion routing that encrypts everything that you do several times. Basically, nobody can track you if you use it. It has legitimate uses like circumventing censorship and protecting yourself from trackers, but because it gives you access to .onion domains which are only accessible by Tor, people can use it for illicit purposes. One of its downsides is that it is usually very slow because it goes through so many layers. If you decide to use it, only do it for legal things. Android on Risk 5 RISC 5 is a new open standard instruction set architecture. Android wasn't really made for it as it only supports ARM and x86, but it has already been ported to RISC 5. They were able to run a graphical interface powered by a T head processor. It is quite slow, but is able to launch a couple of AOSP apps. ADT1 this was a developer kit for Android TV and the first device to run it. It was not required to get it to make apps for this platform, but it was a useful tool for the ones that wanted a more accurate experience. As you can notice, it had an HDMI, USB, Ethernet, and power ports. It came with a controller that looks similar to the one that the Xbox has. Chirp was ported to the ADT1, giving you the possibility to root it. And it W apps. Because you can sideload apps, you can install some that are focused on this type of stuff. It is more likely that these have a virus, at least compared to an average app from an official store. Of course, I won't share any links for them. This entry also refers to the fact that you can find this type of content in unmoderated social media apps like in Reddit, or that even some apps lately have been having some inappropriate apps, ironically, usually including YouTube. JPay. JPay is a company that sells devices made for people in prisons. They ship them with a custom launcher, as expected, and they run very old versions of Android, which could be a double-edged sword, because they will not have a lot of modern features as they don't need them, but I guess that JPay's products could be more vulnerable to old exploits, which has actually happened before. Android never released. 
Android Never Released is a website where people can submit their concepts of future releases of Android. For example, you can find a page for Android 14. It tells you that the creator of the concept imagines Upside Down Cake being released in 2023 with the third names back. It features stacked widgets, a panic mode similar to iOS's lockdown mode, and improved lock screen customization with widgets. They even made a page for its Easter egg. This wiki is not exclusive to to Google's OS, it also has concepts for other ones, and I would recommend you to visit it if you're bored. It's really interesting. Android Mandela Effect a Mandela Effect is a phenomenon where people remember things being a certain way, but when you check, turns out they never were that way. A good example of this in Android is related to emojis. There are people that remember emojis that never existed. For example, a rover emoji that could look like this or like this. There was never a hiker emoji, nor a peace emoji either. Malo ver 1.0.0 this is a creepy poster related to the SCP Foundation. It is about a malicious app with the name of the entry available in stores that has no developer and is able to bypass the approval process, going directly to distribution. It cannot be removed by any program managers and after being installed, you won't find any icon or shortcut to open it. It will begin to send you images via text messaging every 3 to 6 hours including this creature. Eventually, the messages you will get will include pictures taken at locations near you, these pictures will cause you to have visions about the entity and the only way to get rid of these effects is to stop exposure to the pictures prior to 90 hours after installation. Cancelled Phones and Projects most of the times, we do see projects and phones getting released, some succeed and some fail. There are some times when we won't ever know if it would have succeeded because they got cancelled before even getting to some significant production stage. We begin with the Essential Phone 2 that would be the successor of the first Essential product. If you didn't know, this was a phone company made by Andy Rubin, one of the founders of Android, and promised to have stuck Android phones with a lot of updates and openness. However, the company got shut down before ever releasing a second phone. You're seeing images of its prototype. There were plans for what is believed to be even an Essential Phone 3. The most interesting Essential prototype would be the Essential Gem, which is this smartphone with a ridiculously tall aspect ratio that looks more like a TV remote and we don't even know if it ran Android, but it had a card-focused UI. Samsung's Project Valley consisted of a phone with two screens. One was huge and the other one was very thin. It seems that it was from some years ago, judging by the design the phone has, with capacitive buttons and running touch with. One very interesting and unique phone was the Mi Mix Alpha that had a display that wrapped all around the phone, except for a vertical bar, where the cameras are. On the side, you would be able to see your status bar as well as the volume level. On the back, you would see your widgets. A futuristic phone, but it had some important issues, mainly regarding durability and false touches detection. Finally, we have to mention not a phone but a project. Google's Project Era proposed phones that had modular components. For example, if your camera broke, you would just swap the old module and swap in a new one. This would also allow you to upgrade components easier, like the storage or the battery. A great proposal that I wish could have succeeded, but it ended up being cancelled due to expensive ports and heavy, bulky phones. But I wouldn't be surprised if the real reason why it got cancelled was because other companies were sabotaging the project. I mean, they don't benefit from it. Access Random Android Webcams there are some websites that allow you to get access to webcams, which some are powered by Android. Usually, these are in public places and don't have any password, but there are some that could be in private property. I don't know how legal this is, even if you only access the public ones, so I will not share a link for the website and I don't encourage you to visit them. The way they get access to these cameras can be because someone willingly allows you to see their content, but some in other websites could have been hacked. So if you have a webcam, make sure to change the default settings at least to be protected. Unknown vulnerabilities and bugs that could be exploited, but no one has stopped the potential of them. 
As we've seen with vulnerabilities like 30 cal, it is not only very likely but practically a fact that there could be hundreds or thousands of them throughout the whole OS that could and will be exploited for multiple purposes, like installing malware or to gather forensic evidence. Remember, there is no such thing as a bug or vulnerability-proof software. Modded Bank Apps this entry refers to the belief that just by probability, chances are that someone has tried and probably succeeded to mod a banking app, to try to not be charged or to get more money. Of course, this has not been proven and it's not legal at all, so don't try it, but we've already seen a lot of tools that let you decompile apps and other ones like Lucky Patcher that modify programs to benefit you, so it could have happened already. Lost Software it is believed that there have been apps and firmwares, mainly from Wish.com or very cheap phones, that have gone lost due to being so unknown or private. This entry also includes Android builds that never got released to the public and that are probably kept in some drive at Google. All of this is similar to the lost media concept but with software for Android. Apps with zero downloads it is a fact that there are thousands or way more apps that have never gotten and probably will never get even just one download. This makes me think, what kind of content would these apps have? I mean, they could probably be your usual Candy Crush clone, but they could host very weird, probably unmoderated content that was missed by the Play Store's upload review process. Some of these are probably viruses. Keep in mind that the fee that you have to pay to publish all apps you want for a lifetime is of $25. Android running on Androids The Cognitive Anteater Robotics Laboratory has created robots and creature-like robots powered by Android. They even shared the details of how they made them. Two Japanese companies called RT Corporation and Brilliant Service created a bugger robot that took them about 60 days to be built. It can open its mouth, showing the device that powers it, and even dance. Google knows everything about you. This is a suspicion that I think we all have, but it is in the lowest tier of the iceberg because it is not a conspiracy, it's a fact that can be proven. Go to your settings app, then to the Google section, tap on manage your Google account, there tap on the data and privacy tab. Scroll down and you'll find the data that this company has been collecting about you since you created your account. It saves whatever you're seeing from your feed, the Play Store pages you've visited, the notifications sent by Firebase, at what time, if you have clicked on them, from what device, and location. If you have location history turned on, which by default you do, Google will save where you've been and for how long. All of this since you created your account, which can mean that they know where you were at three years ago. It is truly creepy tech, which can be used for good things like knowing where your phone is if it got robbed, but I think that the price to pay can be a little bit too high. Imagine if it was used to manipulate your political or social opinions. Of course, you can disable the tracking, but you will lose its benefits. Also, how do you know if it's really turned off? Like, there have been news of them tracking you even when you have turned it off. Just something to really think about. Android and W content. You know the internet and you know that rule. Well, it happened. There's that type of content related to Android, including Samsung Sam, Bugdroid itself, Sam with Bugdroid, and the Android 10. Uh, I had to apply multiple layers of Gaussian and then pixel blur to avoid getting this video demonetized and I'm still not sure if it will work. I won't mention any more details and for obvious reasons I won't give you the sources, just don't look it up. Andy Rubin's behavior. According to the New York Times and other outlets, Rubin had a very toxic behavior towards his subordinates, thinking they were stupid. He also dated other women while he was married to someone else, pressuring a Google employee into doing inappropriate stuff I cannot mention. Also, some content was found on his work computer. Google quietly paid Rubin a 150 million stock grant and fired him with the condition of agreeing with a clause that prevents him from criticizing the company. Apps with NSL content. NW and 
L content are not the same thing. If I wasn't recommending you to look up the first one, I wouldn't ever recommend you to look up for the latter. It is content so disturbing that can truly traumatize you to the point where you have to go to therapy. Some of it might not even be illegal. Unfortunately, there is always the possibility of apps or games having this content, mainly social medias. For example, some trolls can raid a Discord server sending these pictures and they will get banned and removed but the damage will already be done. Sadly, it is also known that there are obscure telegram groups where people gather to share this type of media and even encourage others to hunt people or other beings and promoting if you ever have the bad luck of encountering any of these, report them immediately to Telegram and also to the police. Cruz's phone content and internet searches. Cruz was a nasty person that did something at a school. He had an injured lollipop or marshmallow phone and its contents are publicly available. Don't look it up as it is reported to all be and all stuff. Over the horizon cursed ringtone. Roni was a veteran that suffered from depression. He took his own life in a live video. His girlfriend was calling him, but he won't respond. All you can hear is his Samsung's phone over the horizon ringtone ringing over and over and over again. It is said that people that have watched the video can get awful memories and trauma by listening to that ringtone again. Okay, this was probably the most interesting video I've ever made. The thing got really dark on the bottom. This video took me several weeks to be completed, so I would appreciate if you could share it or interact with it if you enjoyed it. My next iceberg will probably come out in December or in very late 2022 to close the year, and it's gonna be the Apple iceberg. I know that it breaks a little with the operating system icebergs tradition, but I have a good excuse for that. Apple doesn't have only one OS, so I would have to make a video for each one, and I don't know if it's even worth it. <laughs> Like, nobody's gonna watch the TV OS iceberg. So it's better to include all Apple's OS's and maybe even some other things related to it in the iceberg. Just don't expect it to be as ambitious as this one as I never expected it to be this long. So the next one will probably last an hour or an hour and a half. This was all for today. If you watch all the way till the end, I really don't know how to thank you. Goodbye world, see you in the next one.